Hey folks, how are you doing? It's about 6.15 in the afternoon, early evening in Tampa, Florida, uh, the 11th day of July, 2023. I'm going to have to talk about somebody that I really have a lot of respect for, and that is uh, Norman Finkelstein. Um, last time I mentioned him, I was talking about the fact that he was saying some odd stuff, and he was posting every one of his damn... Every one of his articles, talking about this thing or that thing, in the first paragraph of each fucking article, he had a link to his brand new book. Um, he did a, uh, he's doing a podcast now, or he did a, he, he started a podcast um, in which he had a whole bunch of fucking young people on with him, um, like on a Zoom call, a Zoom call podcast. With like 20 different fucking people all on the same call. And he starts off the thing giving a dissertation on his position on what's happened with the beginning of the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, and I want to take, I, I, I take exception to something that he has done. And I think it is highly disingenuous. And uh, I'm curious about why he did it. So I'm hoping somebody will send this to Mr. Finkelstein. And maybe he will give me uh, an explanation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, to start off with, I have a great deal of respect, and everyone knows I have a great deal of respect for uh, Norman Finkelstein and the work that he has done. Um, and his the body of work that his his career uh, has left behind his uh, stance on Palestine and Palestinian rights um, and the right of a people uh, to demand that the world and the United Nations uh, and the other nations of the world respect their territorial integrity and their uh, demand uh, to be heard as a nation um, when they are under attack from a larger, more powerful country, uh, specifically Palestine. Um, so what troubles me that ultimately... Norman Finkelstein will make the argument. I'll show you a little bit of the end. I can't show you the whole thing because it takes 28 minutes to do what I'm going to do in two with the notes I have here from his discussion. But it's, he's Norman Finkelstein. But what troubles me is he says Russia has the right to do it, but then questions whether or not they should have, meaning engage in... February or early March in fucking uh, in Ukraine. He then makes a comparison, which is extremely disingenuous. And the comparison is between Russia going into Ukraine and Israel attacking Egypt uh, in 1967 during the Six Day War, the war with Egypt and Arab, the other Arab, at all, Egypt at all, um, back in those days. I want to make a point here. Um, he, he makes a distinction. Let me just give you the cliff notes leading up to what I'm going to play for you from him. Um, and again, he's talking to a bunch of young people. Or maybe some want to be... <laughs> the scholars like he is, I don't know who they are. I don't recognize any of the people. But um, And he gives us a little presentation off the cuff. He's a very intelligent man. And basically what he does is he runs down this. He makes two points right off the bat. One, there's a distinction between uh, those who say uh, U.S. provoked Russia into attacking Ukraine and those who caused Russia to attack Ukraine. And he doesn't think that it's, it lines up on the provoked side. He lines up on the 
U.S. caused it side. Um, and we'll explain more of that in a second. He then says that Russia had the right to intervene and invade Ukraine, but in the first part of it, he says he doesn't think they should have done. He thinks it was wrong to do it. And then when he finishes his dissertation and starts to put it to the chorus uh, of others who were in on the call, he says, um, you tell me if they had the right to do it or should have done it or blah, blah, blah. Um, so he kind of backs off of that, but it, 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 that's why I started decided to do this when I, when I heard him say that. But then I wanted to hear his explanation of it. And he says, let me give you an, an, an analogy. He talks about the 1967 Six-Day War, Egypt versus uh, Israel versus Egypt at all. Uh, he never mentions what happened with the USS Liberty. He says Israel lied about firing first. He says they, Israel, of course, came out and said Egypt fired first and they were attacked. They always play the victim. And, of course, that, those lies came out pretty quickly. Then he says Israel admitted they fired first, but he then laid out three fucking factors that they claimed. One, Egypt uh, shut down the straits, which basically uh, provided food resources, materials to Egypt um, and to Israel. And so they were, quote unquote, living on one lung, breathing on one lung. Uh, which was false. B, Egypt massed massive amounts of troops prior to Israel attacking fucking Egypt, also false. And three, Egypt had a meeting with Jordan um, and they were posed to gang up on Israel and all of a sudden attack fucking Israel. And so Israel thought it was an immediate um, and imminent threat. And so based on those three things, that, those three criteria, they said they were in the right to attack first, commit an act of war against Egypt. <laughs> he fails to mention the fact that um, Israel clearly had a plan in place, uh, some in, 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 in cahoots with some people in the United States and uh, upper military uh, and, and political structure in the United States. And during their six-day war, which they started, none of those th three things, by the way, were true. They just, they, they, they coveted something, uh, land from both Jordan and Egypt. And, uh, and so, and of course, Palestine. Uh, so they had a plan and they had already, they didn't, they didn't all of a sudden start painting jets after the fucking first shots were fired. This was done prior to the shots being fired. They had four jets painted up uh, black, so you couldn't tell they were Israeli. Uh, and they uh, attacked the USS Liberty, trying to say that Egypt did it. And there were fucking planes, bombers that had been launched that were en route, carrying nuclear fucking payloads because they were running around saying Egypt had attacked a U.S. warship and killed U.S. fucking sailors. Egypt did not do that. Israel did that. So it's very clear it was never the case that they just misunderstood or thought these three things had happened, and so therefore they were reacting because they thought there was an imminent threat. They wanted something out of it, and they wanted Big Brother United States to help them get it, to help them achieve it, okay? <laughs> to his credit, and he's right, uh, he and many others poked holes in their fucking star, or, or stories and their, their arguments, and they said that they, they, they ended up proving that they were all false. Of course, he doesn't mention the USS Liberty, which is a key factor in this story, this Six-Day War story. Um, but he says, he, he concludes it with this, and I don't know why he's, I do know why he's drawing the comparison between Russia and Israel, because the same people who say Russia is wrong and they're criminal for doing this are the same kinds of people who will say Israel does no wrong. Israel is never wrong. So he's making a comparison using their own weakness against them. So I kind of get that. There'd be a better comparison. Um, 
but want to talk about that. Now, I think the better comparison is Palestine and Israel. And if somebody would have the right to intervene on behalf of Palestine, um, and the answer to that question is, of course, yes. Should they intervene on behalf of Palestine? Of course, the answer is, once again, yes. However, they won't. <laughs> he says um, that if these fucking three things had been true, noting that they weren't, but if they had been true, then yes, Israel would have been justified in attacking Egypt first. Do I agree with that? No. <laughs> he then goes on to say, he wants to talk about, this is his analogy now. Now he's going to talk about the situation with Russia and Ukraine. He says, Russia has been opposed to NATO sanctions and, and NATO uh, expansion uh, since to their borders since 1989 in Gorbachev. And he's absolutely right about that. So there's a long history of Russia being rightly opposed to NATO expanding into uh, right up to their fucking borders. He says, uh, he, though he won't, he, he specifically won't call what happened in 2014 a U.S. special operations, irregular warfare coup. Uh, a color revolution and then a coup. He won't, and, and it's a bloody coup because people died. He won't call it that. I guess because he's being politically, he doesn't want to cause more fucking, but he, he certainly implies that it's a coup, So, but he won't say it. Uh, then he says since 2014, uh, they put all these Nazis into power who supported NATO expansion. Um, and of course, with the Nazis in power, they have a right to be concerned about if NATO is going to expand into Ukraine, then they would put fucking missiles there on their fucking borders, even though NATO says, and Stolen or Schallenberg, whatever his name said, that they would lend Schallenberg, whatever his name was, he said that they'd just be defensive. But what's the difference between a defensive missile and a fucking offensive missile? And he makes a good point there, too. But he says they would also end up being nuclear. So you'd have nukes right there five minutes away from Moscow on their border. So he says they have a, uh, they have a legitimate uh, concern about that. Then he talks about the diplomatic solution attempt since two th December 2021 going into February of 2022. And you have all these discussions back and forth and they made fucking recommendations and they made uh, offers. But they were all rejected. Then he goes into talking about uh, Abiy Abin, who's Israeli foreign minister at the time. And he was saying that, of the 67 thing, and he was saying that, you know, ultimately in the end, Israel had a right to protect themselves because they feared, they had flashbacks to the Holocaust. So they were afraid that there was going to be another Holocaust, this time by Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine. There would be another fucking Palest uh, Holocaust. So that gave them the right because they were afraid that somehow these guys were now, these Muslims are now Nazis. So by extension, uh, Mr. Finkelstein says that so too does, so, so too can, can Russia can make that same argument because the Soviet Union lost 27 million uh, in the war against fascism, uh, the great war against fascism and the Nazis. Uh, they lost 27 million. Uh, the Jewish people, they lost 6 million. Um, uh, so he says that by the same fucking token, On the same token, Russia can make the same claim. Which, according to him, and that's the only evidence he gives, that Russia had the right to intervene and invade into Ukraine. And that leaves us to this. And I'm going to play this short 
section for you here of his new podcast. And I follow him. He's, he does good stuff. So you can certainly follow him. I don't, I, I'm not paid. So you can, there's an unpaid subscription thing. So you can follow as well. That Russia had, but didn't exercise. If you can show me a significant option that Russia had, but didn't exercise, then of course my argument is not compelling. But so far as I could tell, all I heard was Russia need, needed to give more time to diplomacy. More time to diplomacy. I'm thinking to myself, more time to diplomacy? I should think more than 30 years, three decades, is an awful lot of time. <laughs> three decades, that's an awful lot of time. And if they miss one possible option, one tiny option, which I don't even know what it is, but if they missed it, I find it far-fetched in the extreme, far-fetched in the extreme, given that track record that the US or NATO would have agreed to it. I see no basis for that fact. The US was determined with NATO. They were determined to subordinate Russia, to put Russia in a position that it would have to accept any ultimatum coming from the US and NATO or else face military might on its border. And there is no way, in my opinion, that any offer the Russians made short of surrender would have evoked a positive reaction from the West. I see no evidence of that. Okay, now fire away and tell me everything I said that was wrong. Okay, I will gladly do that. <laughs> so I hope that we've gotten to a point where I've, I've, I, you, I, I get, this, was a, this is an accurate rundown of his argument. Um, that they had the right, uh, but it was all based on NATO's aggression and the potential of NATO's aggression. Here's the problem. <laughs> Biden himself says Ukraine's not going to join NATO. Um, they're not ready, according to Biden. Turkey would never, ever, ever vote to allow that to happen. And a good number of European Union countries also are on record and were on record then. No, it wasn't going to take place. <coughs> we are sending arms to Ukraine. What are we not sending to Ukraine? We're not sending ICBMs, nuclear-tipped or otherwise. Um, we're not sending... Apache attack helicopters. We're not sending fucking, they've talked about some agent, ancient F-16s, but so far they haven't shown up that I know of. We're not sending F-35s. We're not loaning them fucking submarines. <laughs> uh, in fact, we're sending them all kinds of stuff and munitions and shit like that to kill people on a frontline basis and lob some howitzers and shit like that. And now, of course, we're sending what they consider themselves to be uh, uh, implements of war crimes, cluster munitions. Uh, we're sending that shit. Um, but we're not really sending stuff for uh, uh, an offensive, a real offensive into fucking Russia. Um, why is that? If, that was just, if this was all about that, then that's what they would have done. But they can't. Why? Because Ukraine's not a NATO, not, not a, not a, not a NATO country. Uh, these would be war crimes, and Russia would destroy them. Period. Russia also 
by the way, Mr. Finkelstein, who will never see this, but I'm still going to act like he would. Um, just because, let's say, just for the sake of argument, um, all of a sudden, everything stops, Russia goes back, the people in Donbass are taped to fucking telephone poles until they all die. It's just happening to looters, Scott. That's fucking bullshit. That's a lie. <laughs> but let's just say that's what happens. And let's just say they join fucking NATO, which would never happen because they'd never fucking vote for it. You bring ICBMs into fucking Ukraine. What are you doing? It's an act of war. Do you honestly fucking think that the United States, who, who couldn't fucking beat the Taliban in Afghanistan, wants an all-out, straight-up war with Russia? Is that what you think? I don't. But they know that's what would happen. And Russia knows that's what would happen. Russia isn't as concerned about... They don't want NATO on their fucking... They don't want it to continue to encroach up into their fucking... <coughs> to their borders. And rightly so. It's supposed to be gone anyway. They're right about that. And they have every, every reason to be concerned about it. However, you know... Um, the, the point is the United States would not do that unless the United States knew that they wanted to fucking start a war World War III potentially nuclear war with a more powerful fucking military because they have stuff that actually works uh, that would also soon include uh, the likes of China and probably Iran and probably a number of European countries who would not be on our side. Um, which might even include France at this particular time. But let's just go back to then. They understood this then. This is only a year and a couple months ago. They understood this shit then. It was never about putting fucking nukes 10 miles off, outside their border. Russia knows they're not going to do it. Russia knows they're not going to be uh, voted into fucking NATO. So, what was it about then? Well, in all of this discussion of yours, Mr. Finkelstein, all of this that I took notes on, just like you wanted because you're the professor and we're just the lowly students, you never once fucking mentioned, you never once fucking mentioned Article 1, Section 2 of the UN Charter, which states that every fucking member state of the United Nations must acknowledge the right to a fucking people to self-determination. They were being bombarded. They were being shelled, and the shelling was increasing exponentially. We sent 200 million additional munitions in December of 2021 alone. 640 million in 2021 preparing for this. We were training. I, sh I, I have articles back to 2014, 2015. We were using CIA and USAID and State Department and DIA. We were training in the United Nations, training their fucking Nazis, training their fucking uh, defenses, turning them into fucking offensive fucking weapons of war to our proxy armies for this conflict. And what they were doing to the people of Donbass, the Russian-speaking people of Donbass, um, was horrific. These were crimes against humanity. This was a genocide that was taking place. Now, of course, you look at the mainstream media now, and they erase that. I'll give you a good example. I used to go to this place called, uh, and if you go back and pull up any of my old videos from the beginning of this conflict, every single time I do one, I show you Ukraine conflict map. 
and then I go I'm back into March and uh, February and January of 2021, and I showed you how the bombing of Donbass area in the region and the and the and the, and the border. Uh, you keep seeing these these from January. You see a few in February. You see a few more, and then early March is like the whole fucking border between Donbass region and the rest of Ukraine was just covered with bomb bombing symbols. They were bombing the shit out of them, and the people in Donbass were begging, begging the world, please. We have declared ourselves an autonomous region. We are we want independence from this illegal regime in Kiev. Please acknowledge us. And finally, in February of 2021, uh, it was put before the fucking, uh, whatever their Congress is called, whatever their parliament is called in Russia, and they agreed. And Putin made the announcement. They were going in to protect the people of fucking Donbass because they were being slaughtered with U.S.-made fucking weapons. They did it a little bit, Russia didn't bite. They did it a little bit more, Russia still didn't bite. They bombed the shit out of them. Russia finally had to take action. You don't mention any of that. You never mentioned one single fucking bit of that. Why? That's what happened. That's why they went in there. And that's why they had a right to do so. And that's why they were not only, it was not only not fucking criminal. <laughs> if you want to be specific about it, and you want to go back to the UN Charter, Article 1, Section 2, the criminal act would be to ignore it. Now, I understand that they've been ignoring shit like this when people are being destroyed and killed, like, say, I don't know, Palestine, for instance. Which, by the way, Mr. Finkelstein, Mr. Finkelstein is well aware of. And sometimes, right to protect is misused. As we did with fucking Libya. As we did in Syria. As we continue to use it, whatever we, wherever we feel the need to fucking try to do a regime change someplace, we make up some bullshit about the, the, the evil dictator fucking killing off their own people. However, the idea, the concept of that does exist. It's written into the fucking UN Charter. Article 1, Section 2. But don't take my word for it. Read it your fucking selves. Article 1, Section 2, Equal Rights and Self-Determination of Peoples. Article 1, Section 2 establishes that one of the main purposes of the United Nations and thus the Security Council is to develop friendly international relations based on the respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. Membership in the United Nations is open to all other peacefully loving states which accept the obligations, the obligations contained in the present charter and in the judgment of the organization are able and willing to carry out these obligations. It was an obligation for Russia to defend Russian-speaking people in Ukraine, in Donbass, from a vicious assault. In December of 2021, President Biden authored 200 million, authorized 200 million in security assistance support to meet Ukraine's immediate defense needs. Defense from what? This package included javelins and other anti-armor systems, which they used on the people of fucking Donbass. Grenade launchers, munitions, which they used on the people of Donbass. And non-lethal equipment essential to Ukraine's frontline defenders. Since 2014, the United States has committed to 2.7 billion, I'm sorry, I said 600 million, 2.7 billion in security assistance to build the capacity of Ukraine's forces, including 650 million in 2021 alone. I did get that right, 200 and 
650 million in 2021. Up until then, since 2014, 2.4 billion. U.S. small arms and ammo arrive in Ukraine as Pentagon details troops to train their military. December 10th, 2001. They're talking about the shelling and intensifying in December. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is February. So it had intensified even from December of 2021 to February 19th, 2022. I've covered a lot of this shit. Here you go. Here's 2014. This is an article I wrote in 2014. CIA front USAID gearing up in Ukraine. Suharto number two. Uh, I can't, unfortunately, play these, but I can on my BitChute channel. I don't know why they won't play over here. I thought I was fucking being wise and putting up videos from BitChute onto my Nomadic Everyman page because they would, of course, not be harmed by a YouTube strike if I end up getting my stuff censored by YouTube. However, I didn't realize that shit just won't fucking older stuff won't play like this unless I actually go to BitChute and there's no link to that, art, to that video on BitChute. So I'm going to have to do a lot of fucking work fixing this bullshit. You can go to my fucking, you can go here. This is my stuff on fucking, from the same time frame, on BitChute. Plays just fine. However, lovely BitChute has reduced my fucking uh, archives to garbage because for some reason you can't get them to play now maybe you guys can maybe there's something going on with a cache or something i've got i have no idea anyway uh i was hoping to find um images from uh the show you where the uh uh ukraine conflict map you can see the massive increase in attacks. Uh, you go, you go, you go to Ukraine conflict map now, and uh, they've edited it. They've changed it. Uh, they tried to also change the number of people killed. Uh, it's about fourteen thousand, but of course they've done the fucking propaganda and the ethic and the and the and the cleansing of that information. Now it's down to 2,000 or something. Uh, it's absolute bullshit. Um, and they've turned this into, uh, they're doing this to looters. A lot of them have uh, signs on them. They don't publish those, but the ones that have signs on them, uh, the signs say traitors. They're doing this to people who are sympathetic to uh, the Russian speaking people that they are attacking and killing. And some may just disappear. For example, I don't know if they've, I mean, they've killed several fucking, uh, they've killed several fucking reporters. <coughs> From what I understand, Gonzalo Lira, that fucking Pinochet loving piece of shit, is still missing, but who knows? I don't know. He may turn up and fucking Tel Aviv for all we know. Um, I don't know why you would leave that out, because that is a compelling argument. It is a compelling argument that Russia, after trying their best and even negotiating, as you point out, as you point out, it wasn't just about fucking NATO. They were fucking negotiating. Let's stop them from killing fucking more Ukraine, Russian speaking Ukrainians in Donbass. Let's stop that shit, too. The NATO thing was, OK, it's part of it's part of it, but let's stop them killing fucking Ukrainians in Donbass. And of course, what do they do? They have reduced the area in which they are occupying, the Russians, to the Donbass area and that area southeast or southwest of, of the Donbass region, uh, uh, 
connecting so that so that it connects Donbass to Ukraine to uh, Crimea, um, that whole fucking area down there, uh, which of course they, they would have to fucking take, because they've also they've also had a referendum in which they don't want to be part of Ukraine anymore, and who blames them? Because their own fucking government's been shelling them. Um, so yes, of course they had a fucking right to interfere. They have an obligation by the UN Charter to do so, but they also have an obligation, a moral obligation, like anybody else would. Like Mr. Finkelstein would probably argue, the entire world has a moral obligation to stop fucking the IDF from bombing Palestinians and from occupying Palestinian land in fucking the West Bank. I'm sure Mr. Finkelstein would make that argument, and it would be sound. Well, that's what's happening in fucking Ukraine. It's really that fucking simple. They have a justified reason for saying this was a regime change that took place. It is illegal, and as Mr. Finkelstein pointed out, unconstitutional regime change that took place in 2014 by an outside party. They put into place people who are more committed to upholding uh, a relationship with outside nations than with the people themselves. And at the same time, they started bringing back Nazis and empowering the Stepan Bandera fucking fanboys in Ukraine. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the people in Donbass had every right to say, we want out. This is not the fucking Ukraine that we signed up for. And then, of course, there was conflicts and there was war and there was eight fucking years of fucking killing between 2014 and 2022. With a total of about 14,000 people dying. Donbass was begging for the world to pay attention, and everyone else turned a blind eye to it. But Russia did not. That is how they fucking baited Russia into this conflict. By literally sending fucking shells and weapons and training Nazis in Ukraine so they could kill Russian-speaking people. And eventually, Russia would have to do something to stop the fucking bloodshed. And they did. I don't know about this argument with fucking the Six-Day War. <laughs> you also tend to leave a lot out of that. Some of which I mentioned, being the liberty, which is a powerful piece of evidence that all three of those fucking justifications were bullshit. Even if they hadn't, let's say they didn't fucking bomb the U.S. Liberty with fucking jets painted black and try to blame it on Egypt. And if they hadn't already had a plan to launch fucking nukes on Egypt as a, as a, as a response because everyone blamed Egypt for that. Even if that hadn't happened and all three of those things had been true, would that give Israel the right to invade and attack Egypt? No. According to Norman Finkelstein, yes. No. Uh, the winds are blowing tell you there's war on the horizon doesn't give you the, the, the right to fucking attack immediately and hope that you can catch them off guard when they're fucking ready. Uh, that's not how it works. If they're building up troops and massing troops and you mass troops, you got the most moral army in the world, they should be able to handle a few Egyptians, right? And if they're talking to fucking Jordan and getting Jordan on their side, or maybe even Lebanon, then you can talk to people. Because you have such good relations with everybody else in the world, right, Israel? That doesn't necessarily mean you posture, they posture, you posture, they posture. According to 
Israel, and according to, apparently, Norman Finkelstein, they passed your fight. And it's okay. Because Holocaust. No, that doesn't justify it. <laughs> as I told you before, as I told you, uh, Russia, I don't think, and they've said in the beginning of this conflict, um, he's a foreign minister for fucking Russia, Lavrov, is that his name? Uh, as he said several times, it wasn't about NATO. Of course, NATO's expansion is something that they're concerned about. But they were not, uh, they're not going to invade a country because they're concerned about something that is so far off and down the road, it's not even worth considering. This is essentially what he said. Uh, because he knows that other nation, other, other NATO countries are going to vote to oppose it. They're going to veto it, namely Turkey. But then there are several others that have come out and said, this is not, no, we can't do this. Now we got fucking France saying the same thing about trying to bring Japan into, into NATO. They're just turning NATO into the fucking axis from World War II. That's all they're doing. But it was never about that. It was about defending a people who had the right to declare their independence from a growing Nazi state in, in Ukraine that had nothing left to do with the same Ukraine that they were part of and they were proud to be part of. They responded, the rest of the world turned a blind eye, turned a deaf ear to their cries. And the fact that you completely forgot about that almost makes me think you're doing the same thing. Thank you for your time. There's your answer. You wanted an answer? You wanted a, a reply? There you go, Norman.